Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's uh, it's morning, sunny, beautiful morning here in London. It's not often sunny in London, but it is this morning. And yes, I'm going to talk about electronic health records. Thank you for the introduction. And I have never been to Kyoto, so one day I will, I'm sure. And I'm going to talk about electronic health records and their use. And the, the, um, for much of my career, I've been using different forms of computerized health data and uh, initially data from the UK only, and then increasingly data from many other countries as well. And I do think we can get a huge amount of uh, great research from electronic health records, but I do think we do need to make sure we're doing the best we can. Um, thanks to many people who have helped and uh, with various bits of work over the years. And I also just want to Pay, um, say thanks to John Ioannidis for the paper he wrote in 2014 that really started me thinking more and more about this need to get really good research out of whatever we do and how, and how we might go about that. So I guess I'm talking about part of the kind of big data revol revolution, as it's known, and is big data, it's a new catchphrase that's used all over the place. It's... Um, and is it really something new? And I'm not sure if it is something new. I think we, we know we have more and more and more health-related data, computerized data available for research. And that's one thing. And we also know that genomic and metabolomic data are available now on a scale that we couldn't have imagined uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So the big data, it is kind of literally true. There is an awful lot more data. And I'm going to talk about the first part of, of this data explosion today, this explosion in clinical data, and how we go about getting better research out of it. And I guess the main point I want to get across is that using computerized data give us, gives us extraordinary opportunities. And the, the thing I'm going to talk mostly about is we need to resist the idea that we can therefore do really cheap and really quick research. Um, and of course, that's an advantage in one way, but the world doesn't just need a huge volume of research. It really needs to be the right research and it needs to be robust and reliable and addressing the important questions. And ideally, using these data for research that we otherwise couldn't be done or and it's really up to us to ensure we take the opportunity to do better research, not just more research. And I guess that's my, my take home message uh, of the whole lecture would be it's up to us to do better research, not just more. So I'm going to use lots of examples. I'm going to talk about things we've done over the years, trying to illustrate what can be achieved and what can go wrong and some of the challenges. And I'm going to talk specifically about a new area of a new platform we've developed specifically for COVID um, at the end, which illustrates a lot of the points I'm going to make through the talk. So how can we do better research? So this is um, one of those kind of airport books you always see, Conquering the Seven Summits, this was called. And I've, I've slightly uh, adopted the cover because it seemed... It wasn't actually an 11 step program for better electronic health record research. It was a seven step program to um, get more profit out of business. But the, the point is that it seems sensible to me to try and break down how do we get better research into some components. And of course, there are many, many components. And I'm going to present 11 key things for me today, but there are others and they're, they're not set in stone and they're, and they're arguable. But I'll present what I think are 11 particular things we can focus on to make sure we're getting uh, better research. And uh, step one, with all this data, uh, and perhaps the, the, the one thing that is true of the big data revolution is that we need new approaches and new methods to deal with all this data. And in the use of electronic health records, uh, when we're particularly when we're looking at the impact or the effectiveness of different interventions or the effect of something on health outcomes, I think we have a massive problem and one of the major challenges is overcoming confounding. 
um, where exposures get mixed up and we are trying to disentangle whether something is causally impacted on an outcome and we really can't tell. And I think this is an area where innovation has played a big part and we've, there's been a development of many novel study designs in epidemiology to try and address this issue of con overcoming confounding um, propensity scores and case-only approaches, marginal structural models and all the rest of them, even down to using uh, genetic variation to try and overcome confounding in, in innovative ways, which is clearly what we need. And I'll show you an example. Um, where are we? The key is we do an observational study using these data and how do we know we've got the right answer? Say we're trying to assess whether something has caused an effect on an outcome. How do we know we've got the right answer? And we were thinking hard about this. Um, after a study came out about statins, the cholesterol-lowering drugs, very effective against cardiovascular disease, and a big study, a big case control study came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, 2005. And it really caught my interest um, because they seem to suggest that use of statins was associated with uh, an odds ratio for colon cancer of 0.5. Now, you could look at that and think, well, that's inconceivably large protective effect. Surely we can't have halved the risk of cancer um, kind of accidentally or by luck by using statins. So it's a bit implausibly large. And it did seem a little inconceivable. And we began to think maybe there was something in this study, in this study design, particularly confounding, particularly the issue that people who use statins might be different people who don't use statins um, that created this very large protective effect that's quite spurious and isn't causal. So we did a big study uh, using electronic health records and using propensity scores where one takes all the variables one has and tries to match people essentially on the likelihood of them being exposed to statins. And we did this study and, and what we did to try and ensure we were getting the right answer was validate the answer we were getting against things that we thought were already true. So we thought already that statins protected people against heart attacks and that we should see a protective association against heart attacks which we did in our study, and we got roughly the same answer as you one sees from trials with a little bit of variation. So it gave us a lot of um, reassurance that we were getting the right answer by looking at heart attacks. Then when we looked at cancer, we saw no effect whatsoever. So nothing like the halving in incidence of colon cancer that was seen in the previous study, we saw no effect whatsoever. And this was we published this in 2009, and subsequently, very, very large trials and a very large meta-analysis in 2015 showed no effect on cancer at all. And this has been subsequently shown again and again. And it convinced me that we could, using these innovative methods, overcome confounding sometimes, and that we could validate the answers we're seeing against answers we already think are true to give us reassurance and try and convince ourselves that we're on the right track and making the right progress. Step two, remember this is an 11 step program. Don't worry, some of them are quite quick. Um, some of them are a bit slower, but step two in this 11 step program. So we've got some innovative methods, particularly about overcoming confounding. Step two, a really crucial area for using electronic health records, I think is data quality. Uh, and how do we validate that? And how do we assess whether the data we're using are any good? And of course, these are data that have been collected as part of routine care or routine activities. They haven't been collected with research in mind as a primary aim. And so one has to think about, will the data be any good? Will they be accurate? Will they be complete? And there's all sorts of things we can do about that. And one of the things we did was uh, looked at the quality of data around heart attacks in, in England and we did this by linking up data from primary care, general practice, from hospital admissions, from a specific disease registry that the UK has for heart attacks, and from national mortality records. So people who have died and whether they've died of a heart attack or not. And we linked these all up to see what the different data sources were telling us and whether 
linking them gave us any better information. So the primary care data was from the CPRD, Clinical Practice Research Data Link, hospital data from HES, it's called in the UK, mortality data, and this specific disease registry, and we linked them all up. And on incidents, it was quite interesting. Not surprisingly, the death registry had a much lower incidence um, because it was only capturing the people who died from their heart attack. But as we will go forward, you can see the disease registry was capturing quite a few of the heart attacks. Hospital admission was capturing quite a few of the heart attacks, a few more. But primary care data was capturing even more. And when you combine the data sets, uh, and really, you really do begin to capture what appears to be a much better idea of incidents so that matched our ideas on incidents from primary studies and from studies over the years of incidents of heart attacks in the UK. And the other thing that this study showed us was that the, the data from the hospital-based studies, particularly the disease registry that had cardiac tracings and cardiac enzymes and all sorts of other details, the data was very high quality. We knew this was a heart attack. We knew what sort of heart attack. And when we validated that against the primary care record, we were able to see which of the, which of the measures were most valid. And we could not only measure incidents more accurately, but we could also determine which of these recorded heart attacks seem to be genuinely heart attacks. Uh, step three in the program is a little bit of a, a thing of mine. This isn't particularly specific to electronic health records, although p-values are a real issue when one has so much data. And I think I initially, when I was thinking about this, had a step called get rid of p-values and stop, stop reporting them altogether. But I've softened a little. <laughs> and I think what we need to do is interpret them correctly. The problem with p-values is, as everyone knows, there's an arbitrary threshold. This p0.05 is entirely arbitrary. It's up to us to decide where that threshold is. There's nothing magic about it. 0 is 0.05. P-values are useless. They tell us nothing at all when the true effect is the null effect. P-values give no indication of the strength of effect. And sometimes a very small P-value isn't. You see it being interpreted as, as a strong evidence, whereas in actual fact, all it means is less random error. Uh, it's nothing to do with the strength of evidence and certainly nothing to do with the strength of effect. And p-values, I think, are a particular problem when we have loads of data and we have millions and millions and millions of people's data. Uh, they are a particular problem. So I think they can have a role. Actually, interestingly, particularly in genomics rather than in uh, other data. But we just really need to interpret them correctly and not over this over-reliance on p-values. I'm pleased to say it has been eroded and it is going. But I think we can do more uh, to get rid of that reliance on p-values we've had over the years. And particularly this issue that they really are useless when the truth is null. So if we're, if, we, if we're truly looking at a situation where there is no effect going on, then p-values really will be of no value at all. What we should be doing much more is reporting confidence intervals, um, because they really do tell you both about the degree of random error, but also give you an idea of where the estimate lies. They're useful even if the, true, if the null effect is the true effect. And they just give a much, much more nuanced, much, um, more, much clearer, I think, idea, a much more realistic idea of our data. The other thing we can do is, is specify a priori, meaning uh, beforehand in, in Latin, of all things, but, um, and specifying our hypotheses before we even try them out, of course, helps with p-values. But even then, I think it's better to be reliant on confidence intervals rather than p-values. They give this precision of estimate, confidence intervals, and they, they, they can, of course, p-values can, of course, have a useful role when a design pre-specifies millions of comparisons. So in omics, and you'll be aware of a genome-wide association studies, then, of course, we know we'll be doing millions and millions of uh, hypothesis testing. Um, and p-values do, of course, have a value there in, in sifting out possible signals that are worth pursuing in greater detail. As long as we're not using them to say, right, we've found the truth, then I, I don't have an issue with them. So they can be useful. Uh, so rather than get rid of them, use them when they're going to be useful and interpret them correctly, it would be better than get rid of them. 
Um, research transparency is a really big thing for me. And when one thinks about the scientific, empirical scientific method, and you think of a scientific paper, and, um, and what a scientific paper is there for, and historically, scientific papers came from a detailed reporting of methods such that other scientists could reproduce and redo a study if they so wished and could reproduce the findings of a study. And that's the point of reporting methods in a paper. And as some of you know, in Nature, for example, Nature, the journal's big papers, they often put the methods in sort of smaller font at the end of a paper, and they're often very long. But they're there as a reassurance, and they're there as, as to be used, if some, sometimes, to allow other scientists, if they wished, to recreate and reproduce uh, a scientific experiment. And when we're using large scales of computer, large scale computerized data, I think we've lost this reproducibility as an aim. And I think it's really important that we, we maintain it and that we're using these data you know, and producing findings. And we need to document things such that other scientists could come along and redo our study and assess whether they get the same findings. And it's really key to the empirical scientific method that we, that we hold so with such high value, and rightly so. We do need reproducibility. I think lots of things can help us. We've done some work um, whereby all our coding systems and the codes we've chosen and how we've chosen them, we, we routinely report on a, a thing called data compass at the School of Hygiene. I'll show you an example. And of course, increasing use of GitHub as an example. And I, I'll show you this in relation to COVID later on, um, means that not only can the clinical codes, but even the programs that have been run and how they've been implemented can all be transparently available uh, to other researchers. This is an example of a, a data compass entry th th from one of our studies. So we published this paper in uh, PLOS Medicine and this is a sort of a supplementary material that we maintain, which gives all the coding and the clinical coding and the details of the data and all sorts of other things that would allow other scientists to come along and replicate uh, what we'd done, reproduce what we'd done if they, they so wished. The other thing about transparency is having pre-specified protocols. And I think in the, in, if you go back a long way, um, decades perhaps, whereby basically every health-related research project would involve setting up a study, getting ethical approval, and going out and collecting data from participants. Then, of course, by default almost, everyone had a protocol already developed. And then we started to get these large-scale studies with lots and lots of data collected, and then increasingly large-scale studies where the data weren't even collected for research, they were just available from health records. And people started to analyze these data, I think often without having a protocol, just analyzing the data, see what their data throw up, and pursuing it. And, and that clearly can be of value if it's done properly in terms of exploring possible hypotheses and, and mining the data for signals and things. But often I think it was done in quite a selective way and spurious signals getting thrown up all over the place. And one of the things that I quite like about these large-scale international resources that are becoming available, such as UK Biobank, uh, which is a cohort of 500,000 people in the UK, and anyone around the world can apply to use the data. And one of the things I like about these big resources is that you have to pre-specify your protocol in order to get access to the data. And this doesn't mean that you have to then do every single line of the protocol that you said you were going to do. And what's, in, what's important is that, of course, science can adapt and be iterative as you go on, but people can see where you've gone from your protocol, why you may have changed things and what impact that's had if everything is pre-specified in the first place. So I really like the fact that these big studies and, and big data sets are now have enforcing people to sort of say, well, if you want access to data, you need to pre-specify your protocol. I think it's real progress. 
Open data, I think open data can be a big challenge with health data. Um, health data are clearly very sensitive, very private, very confidential. There may well be um, ownership issues, either commercial or indeed health systems. And, um, and so reproducing and recreating a study from these data can be difficult because it can be difficult for other scientists to share the data. And I'll come back to this at the end when I talk about COVID and the work we've been doing on, on Open Safely. Uh, better reporting, uh, better reporting of science is uh, something dear to my heart. And we did um, a big piece of work called the Record Initiative, which was a consensus statement around better reporting of studies using uh, electronic health records and other routinely collected data. Um, it's been quite successful. And we, 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 we did a whole development process of getting people in to, and talking about what we thought were the important factors. It's really an extension of the strobe uh, consensus statement. And it's a, it provides a checklist for authors and editors of what should go in a paper of reporting uh, electronic health records research. And here's a simple example that the type of data, and ideally the name of the databases should be in the, in the title or at least the abstract, that you know, whether the data were person level, institutional level, whether there were any linkages done, and if there were, what methods were used, and how was quality assessed? So some pretty straightforward points, but they, they, applying the checklist really does raise the uh, standard of reporting. Um, it was published originally in PLOS Medicine. There's been various iterations and development since, uh, but they're all on the website. Step five, replication. Can we reproduce studies? So the whole point of transparent science and reporting methods is that other scientists could come along and replicate. And it's interesting in sort of population health sciences that can we, you know, we, 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 we've learned a little, I think, from genetics and biology. And the, with the new sort of genetic revolution since the turn of the millennium, what we've seen in population genetics is that a study isn't even, can't even usually be published, never mind accepted, until it's been replicated. And, and that's been true in a lot of the biological sciences for many years. And it quite, was quite a new concept, I think, for a lot of population health scientists, uh, this need for repl replication. And I think the, the, the idea is that if an answer is robust and definitive, then it can be replicated. It can be replicated using the same data. It can be replicated using different data in different settings. And I'll show you an example. This is one of the first studies that got me interested in electronic health records. Many of you may remember or may not remember because I'm older than most people, but in 1998, when I was studying my master's actually at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, there was a paper in The Lancet suggesting that measles, mumps, rubella vaccine might cause autism, cause huge uproar. Um, there was a lot of concern MMR vaccine coverage fell internationally and measles outbreaks began to occur. And uh, this is data from the UK, in actual fact from England, one of the countries in the UK. And you can see that we were doing pretty well with measles, mumps, rubella coverage above 90%, which of course is important for herd immunity against measles. And if you get above 90% with this vaccine, you can effectively stop measles circulating. And the study published in the Lancet raises concerns there towards the end of 1998. And you can see straight away this impact on vaccine coverage. Well, I know a dropping off, dropping off, dropping off down to 80%, nowhere near the 90% required uh, within a few years. So I thought, could we use electronic health records to, to study this? And the um, UK Medical Research Council funded us to do so. And at the same time, I didn't know at the beginning, but when we published it, it was all published at roughly the same time, which was good. There were similar large studies going on in the USA and Denmark. And these studies of MMR vaccine and autism were only possible, only possible because of electronic health records. Now, these studies took us a long time to do because we were new to this area and new to electronic health records. And it was a whole new way of doing things. So it, they did take us years, but if we hadn't had electronic health records and we'd had to go out and collect data and find thousands and thousands of kids 
affected by autism and thousands and thousands of unaffected kids and matched them up and got all the data, we'd probably still be studying them now. So these studies were possible to do so quickly because of electronic health records. And this is a similar graph. I've extended it. And that shows you the, the risk paper published in The Lancet that was subsequently retracted, of course, in 1998. And uh, this is one of those graphs where it looks like um, I saved the world. But of course, it wasn't just our study that was published in 2004. Other studies were published and there were political campaigns and WHO got involved. And all sorts of people um, helped uh, get confidence in the vaccine back. And all sorts of people worked really hard to get coverage of the vaccine back up again. And over the subsequent um, several years, we got coverage back up above 90%, thank goodness. But the reason I was going to show you this, apart from showing that there's a power of using electronic health records, was also to show you this replication idea. Now, our study, the MRC study, is the bottom square. This is a forest plot showing you the individual studies here. And this is the combined estimate, uh, this diamond. And you can see that the Madison was the Danish study, the Stefano was the American study, and our study. And when one, one could take all these studies and see this remarkably consistent, borderline protective, nothing really in it, there were, none of them were actually protective. Um, but when you combine the study, not only were the studies showing the same thing, but when you combine the studies, then you get this consistent, very powerful estimate um, really showing no alarming effect at all, if anything, a slightly decreased risk, which I don't think is causal. I think there was probably a slight element of kids who were concerned about having the vaccine put off. So I don't think it's actually a protective thing. The important thing is this replication was able to occur. Even though we didn't set out to do it, it shows you the value of, of it having been done. Uh, collaboration. Collaboration is very... Uh, critical, I think, and a really important part of making better use of these very large scale resources. Um, between teams, we need a lot of new skills, a lot of new methods. There's often going to be people, um, more than one group, addressing a single question using the same resource. And that's fine. I think I don't have a problem with that. I think it can actually be useful. It can be very useful to collaborate together. Sometimes it can be useful to different groups to pursue the same question using the same data using very slightly different methods that can also be useful but i do think the collaboration is most likely to lead to the breadth of expertise the larger size of studies allow pre-planned replication and transparency to happen and it's much more likely to result in definitive answers and i think this is for me what we're really after is definitive answers i'll just get rid of that um the definitive answers is what we really want here, rather than multiple, 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 ever more smaller and not so great studies. What we're really after are definitive answers for the big questions facing us. Um, it's okay, step seven, it's okay to be wrong. I think this is a really important part of all scientific processes, not just um, using electronic health records, but all of them. Um, that science is a, a process it's an iterative process. And occasionally, you know, we end up with the right answer and centuries and centuries later, we think, oh, yeah, OK, that was that pretty good. So the concept of gravity, for example, has, has stood the test of time, shall we say. And I think we, someone got that right many hundreds of years ago. But even our understanding of gravity will change over time and we'll get a better understanding. And some hypotheses will be shown to be perhaps not the greatest and others have replaced them. And I think that's great. That's progress. And to make progress, we have to be wrong sometimes. So we, we sometimes call saying it's okay to be wrong to be in my own group to say it's okay to make progress. And that's what I think we're after. And I'll show you an example. So here's, here's me presenting a study of ours that was um, we then showed was wrong. We might be a little brave, but here we go. So we were interested in antipsychotic drugs, uh, widely used drugs, um, particularly in older patients, uh, quite widely used in the UK. And we were interested in this idea that they might be increasing the risk of stroke. And we used a, a case-only approach uh, where one compares 
periods within a person before and after they effectively uh, using these drugs while they're using the drugs versus not using the drugs. So these exposed versus unexposed. And we showed this quite marked increased risk of stroke that was particularly present uh, for people with dementia who use these antipsychotic drugs um, to the point of a you know, risk ratio of 3.5, which is pretty high. So more than a tripling of risk of stroke during periods using these drugs against periods not using these drugs. And we published this in the BMJ and it was quite influential and the regulators took it pretty seriously. And um, it was, you know, we'd done the best we possibly could. And we were doing some more work on this data set and thinking a bit more about stroke and what was happening and the timing. And uh, one of the things we noticed and this was quite early on in terms of us using this particular method. But one of the things we noticed was that many, many people's observation periods in the health records ended very soon after their stroke. This is a graph showing that. So this is the count of strokes up here. On the bottom here is interval until the end of observation. And what we noticed was there were these large numbers of people having strokes whose observation period promptly ended. And it wasn't immediately obvious, but after we thought about it briefly, uh, it seemed pretty clear that a lot of these people were dying from their strokes, uh, but were surviving long enough for them to come back into routine medical care and for them to subsequently die. But they were dying much more quickly than, uh, than, than the general population. And what this meant was that their observation periods were being curtailed by mortality and their chance of exposure was being curtailed. And we re, what we did was we worked with Paddy Farrington, who developed the case only approach, and we developed a different approach, a different method of taking this into account where you adjust for censoring by taking a sort of population rates that you're expecting to see and adjusting for the mortality that happens in your data set. And we, the middle column shows our initial results that we published in the BMJ and the column here, uh, oh, sorry, shows you after we adjusted for censoring. And uh, you can see that the, fortunately for us, I suppose, in one of the world, there's a, the main result remained robust, but there were some slight differences in one or two other results, uh, which did matter, but they didn't particularly affect, I'm pleased to say, the conclusions of the study or the regulatory action that had been taken. But it did show that we'd made progress, we'd further developed a method that we were using, and had basically done a better job of it. And we had got slightly different findings. And that was okay. And we issued a correction. And, uh, and it was, uh, it was, a, you know, it was a pretty important experience, I think, for all of us involved, because, of course, we'd spent a year getting the best possible answers we could and really thought we had full, robust, you know, answers we believed in. That within a couple of years, we'd actually developed our methods further and thought we could do better. And lo and behold, we could do better. And we got slightly different answers. Step eight is change academic reward system. And this, this, what I mean by this, and I think this is true to some extent worldwide, it's a major problem uh, in the UK, and I think in many other countries as well, particularly in the US and across Europe. I can't confidently say to what extent this is a problem in Japan, <laughs> but I can talk about the Western European experience. And what I'm talking about is that we need better research, not just more research. And this volume, this massive volume of research that we're seeing in the modern world is, is less and less helpful. And what we need is better definitive research, which is often going to mean larger scale collaborations and working together over time to get the best answers possible. And yet yeah, our systems work against this to some extent. This is an example I was um, interviewing on the panel, interviewing for a clinical uh, post, clinical academic post. And in the checklist of requirements for this job, it was a, a sort of associate professor level post, was that, of course, the person had to be a specialist in internal medicine, tick, yeah. they had to be immune to hepatitis B, tick, this is all very reasonable. 
They had to live within 10 miles of the hospital, seems a reasonable tick. And then they had to have 20 peer review publications. And it literally was tick, yes or no. So all that mattered was that they had at least 20 publications for their academic track record. No measure whatsoever of uh, quality, of impact, of usefulness, of robustness, of their ability to develop meaningful collaborations and work with other people, their ability to bring through the next generation of researchers, um, none of that. It was literally a tick, just like being immune to hepatitis B, tick, yes or no, 20 peer review publications, yes or no. And this reward system goes directly against this idea that we need better research, not just more research. It really does reward just straightforward volume. And what you've got to do is accumulate 20, 20 publications and you'll be able to get an associate professor post. Whereas what we should be saying is do some really good research that might only be one publication and you can get an associate professor post or even no publication to actually maybe one to prove that you've actually done something. So I do think we need to change that system. Uh, science, not sensation. This, um, this came really came home to me that the, the not just the lay media, but also the scientific literature, of course, are very interested in headline grabbing and uh, sensational findings. And this really came home to me when we, we, we showed a major finding wasn't actually true. And I'll show you what happened here. So there was <clears throat> quite a lot of concern that uh, PDE5 inhibitors, which are Viagra, for example, here's Viagra, um, might increase the risk of malignant melanoma. This was quite a surprising finding for us. And there were some conflicting studies, but the, the big main study published in JAMA had shown this increased risk. And we thought this might well not be the case and uh, looking at the study and thinking about the biology. And we did a big study. And what we were particularly interested in was whether people who use Viagra might have uh, a greater propensity to get sun exposure. And sun exposure being a major risk factor for malignant melanoma. So if people who were more likely to take Viagra had more prior sun exposure, they'd be more likely to get malignant melanoma. And that might explain the findings without it being the Viagra causing the problem. And of course, sun exposure, uh, which includes some sunbeds and things, is very difficult to measure, particularly in health records. But we thought we could use solar keratosis, which is um, well-documented skin damage from excess sun exposure and prior solar keratosis as a marker of high levels of sun exposure. So people who have lots of sun exposure are much more likely to get solar keratosis. So could we use prior solar keratosis? So before anyone even took Viagra, could we use solar keratosis to identify people who'd already had a lot of sun exposure? And when we did this, we showed that rather than uh, there was a strong association between prior solar keratosis and first initiation of a PDE5 inhibitor. So people who had prior solar keratosis were much more likely to start Viagra, which is quite interesting. And of course, once we adjusted the study estimates for this, we showed that in fact, Viagra didn't causally increase the risk of melanoma. The association was due to prior sun exposure. And we sent this to JAMA <clears throat> and uh, as a big paper, you know, I thought it was quite important. And I mean, the JAMA is a journal I've got great respect for. And they, they, they sent us uh, quite a funny letter and it said the referees had some concerns and the concerns were fine. We could deal with those. And we would have considered it for publication if your findings had been different, which was <laughs> a very uh, blunt way of showing that, you know, our study had shown, in fact, there was no effect of Viagra on skin cancer, melanoma. And that was a bit, you know, well, I don't think they cared that it contradicted their previous study they published. I think they cared that it wasn't very sensational and it wasn't going to get in the newspaper and, you know, tell the newspapers, well, you know, that thing and that thing that you wrote all those headlines about is actually not true. Perhaps it wasn't <clears throat> what they wanted to hear. So develop expertise. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a straightforward step in the 11-step program, of course, 
if we're going to use all these data as best we can, we're going to have to develop expertise and develop new expertise. And there's a whole range of new expertise uses needed. The last step is keep the public with us. Um, in much of uh, Europe and, and, and many, many other areas, there's huge public concern about the use of people's personal data, particularly the use of their health data, because it is so sensitive and confidential. And one of the things we've successfully done uh, in many campaigns around um, different countries in the world, actually, is to convince people that we need to use their health data in order to deliver high quality health care. And what we also need to convince people is that we can look after their data, <clears throat> that we value their data. And I think this is an example of a campaign from the UK. It's called Data Saves Lives and um, led by a, a group called Understanding Patient Data. And this is on the bottom of a lot of the papers where we've used data from the UK health service called the National Health Service or the NHS. And it's just acknowledging that the data are provided by patients and collected by the NHS as part of care and support, and we've used those data. And the, it's been quite an influential campaign and, and has had a lot of um, good impact in terms of people feeling better about researchers using their data. But it's clear that confidentiality and security are key. And of course, you know, my data are sensitive. My data are private. I want them kept private. I don't want people to use them for bad purposes. And one of my long-term aims was to think that what people, I think, really want to know, of course, they want to know their data are protected and are secure and confidential. But I think what people really want to know is what are their data being used for? And I've off, I long thought that we should and could be able to do this. We should be able to have a, people's clinical data and be able to document quite easily every single use that that data is put to, every single study and who has accessed it and why and what they've done with it and where the results are. And I've often thought for many years that that should be possible. And this would be hugely reassuring to patients whose data we are using. And I'm delighted to say, and I'll show you in a minute, that we've actually achieved this now and uh, uh, during COVID, and we, I'll show you what we've done. Just to finish, before I move on to the, the COVID example, which illustrates all these points, really, just to summarise again, that I think this computerization of health records is giving us extraordinary opportunities for research. It's for cheaper and quicker research. Of course we could do, but that isn't really what we need. What we need is better research, research that we couldn't do otherwise, uh, not just more research. We really want to be doing the best possible research we can do. Um, this is the 11-step program, just to go over it again. I mean, as I said, these, these are kind of 11 points I've drawn out as being of particular importance or relevance in, in making better use of these data. But of course, there are many other uh, equally important issues. These aren't the only 11 by any means. And I just thought I'd talk a bit about putting these sort of ideas into practice uh, in the COVID pandemic and talk about a research platform that uh, I've co-led development of with uh, Ben Goldacre from the University of Oxford and with the help of data providers, TPP and EMIS, who are clinical data software providers and NHS England, who we've worked very closely with to ensure all this is done to, uh, very well and, prior, and confidentiality is maintained. And what the Open Safely Collaborative is, it's a platform um, it's not 254 million, that's a typo. Initially, it was 24 million. I don't know where that five came from. 24 million patient records based on TPP clinical software from primary care. On the left of the slide here, um, we've now increased that to 55 million through the addition of EMIS software. And we've got almost the whole population of England now captured. And we've got their primary care data. Um, and then, whoops, moving along, we've got SGSS, which was the main COVID testing data in the UK. We've got accident and emergency um, attendances at hospital. We've got hospital admission data. We've got intensive care admission data and uh, clinical data. 
deaths in hospital and deaths in the community. And we've, and we've increased actually more and more data over the time in different data sets, but that, that's the core of the platform all linked up. Initially 24 million, now 55 million. And what we've done is, is accepted that these data, so someone goes to a doctor in the UK, the primary care physician, and the primary care record in the UK National Health Service is very much the central repository. And uh, clinicians such as myself will tap, 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 and enter some data. This person's got COVID or whatever it is. And those data are held and stored by the software vendors, TPP or EMIS. And they're, they're held and stored very securely. There's never been a data breach from these software providers. They really know what they're doing. They daily, hourly, every minute, link these data to data coming in from hospitals and labs and mortality and all sorts of other things. And what we thought was if we could take the analysis to the data, so don't, let's not move the data at all, let's leave the data with the software vendors where it's been held securely for years, and let's take the analysis to the data. So the data don't move at all. The data is staying on the servers and the cloud-based parts of these software vendors, and we are taking the analysis to the data. And it means that data don't move around. Um, but it, most importantly, it means that all use is transparent and reproducible, and I'll show you how we do that. And there's a cohort extractor, which is a sort of key bit of the software that allows researchers to extract bits of data uh, ready for an, and to, to analyze on the servers. And if it's, poss it's possible to generate dummy data, which is obviously of no, um, there's no confidentiality concerns at all. It's literally um, synthetic data. It's, it's possible to generate that and it is possible to export that because um, it's of no confidentiality. As I say, there's no problem with anonymity. But if you want to actually analyze the clinical data, you do it on the server of the software providers. And you can use Stata, R, Python, you can use whatever you want. Um, and the data stay there. And of course, what that means is that only people, well, there's all sorts of levels of access available, but only people with specific approved secure access at each stage can actually get in there. Every single keystroke is, is recorded and audited. Their every move around the data is linked back to what they're doing and the protocols that they've, they've lodged, predated. Um, and it really, and it's impossible to extract data uh, from the server, of course. And it's been really for me quite revolution because it literally means that we have this clinical data that we've managed to link up to all these different data sets. And every single use of those data are fully auditable there's, a, tr there's, a, there's a, a trail of every single keystroke used on every single bit of data. And every user, we know exactly who they are. Uh, we know exactly what they're doing and why. Um, and, they have, they've all, and they all have pre-approved you know, proposals and protocols for every bit of work they do. And it's been quite a revolution. Um, the resource is called Open Safely. I'll talk about this first article we produced called um, In Nature. And there's a big article, a lovely article in The Economist of all things about what a great approach this is that's there. So when COVID hit uh, the UK um, in March 2020, really was when it really took off. And we started to, uh, I actually was quite ill with COVID. <laughs> and then I kind of got better in mid to late March. And we started to think about this, Ben in Oxford, Goldacre and I, and we thought we might be able to do this um, and it would be really useful for COVID. And one of the very first things we did was this huge study looking at uh, all the deaths from COVID in the UK, in England, actually, not UK, based on 17 million adults. And we published this in Nature and it really was the sort of largest and most definitive um, establishment of risk factors for death from COVID um, very early in the pandemic. It, <laughs> I'd say it nearly killed us doing it, but it felt important. And uh, I think we, at that time, I think we thought this was a pandemic that was going to be around for a few months. 
and then go away. So it was we, we could survive sort of working 14 hours a day, seven days a week, because um, it was all going to get better in a few months. Uh, so 18 months later, it's uh, sadly not got better. But this is what we did. So it's 23 uh, million or so um, people in the software. And then we were looking at adults only initially. And, uh, and then we looked at linked COVID-19 deaths. Uh, and we were able to include about 11,000 deaths at that time. Of course, it's climbed a lot since then. I won't go into the methods. As you can imagine, I could um, talk for hours about the methods. Let's suffice to say we did it really properly. And essentially, the, the results you'll see are based on Cox regression. This is just to show you, you're not supposed to be able to see it. It's just to show you these are risk factors of varying source. And these are the effect estimates. And they're 95% confidence intervals and the various versions of this graph. What's great is when we publish this on the web, within about 10 seconds, I'm not kidding, about a minute, maybe. Someone somewhere, a Star Wars fan, had decided that these little things look like Star Wars fighters. I can't remember what they're called now. And within a minute, had published another version of our graph, which looks like this, with the Death Star and the, uh, and the fighter pilots all milling around. But uh, these are the risk factors and these are the effect estimates. Just to zo zoom in to show you, here's diabetes, and we showed that uh, uncontrolled uh, diabetes was a quite a major risk factor for dying from COVID, more of the doubling of risk, showing that uh, non hematological malignancy was a particularly major risk factor and particularly recent uh, hematological malignancy. And here's some results by age showing this incredible age gradient, um, which would be become apparent really as we were doing this study. This doubling of risk of dying of COVID for every about six and a half years increase in age, which you see very markedly here, even in the fully adjusted model, this rate ratio of 20 compared to the uh, cat, people in their 50s who we use as a reference category. Uh, we saw this, saw this marked sex ratio. We saw this big impact on of obesity, on risk of dying from COVID, and this very influential study and, and, and led it fed into a lot of policy worldwide. These are just the, uh, the age effects, which were incredible. Uh, we were very surprised to see them. We kept on checking and rechecking. We couldn't quite believe it was as steep as it was, but it, it was indeed that steep. Interestingly, in the UK, we have, uh, to some extent, a, a mixed ethnic population. And one of the major findings from this study uh, was to see this increased risk of death from you know, among non-white groups in the UK, particularly uh, in people of, from South Asian and, and Black Afro-Caribbean backgrounds. And we also saw this marked um, deprivation effect whereby people living in more deprived areas of England uh, had close to a doubling of risk of dying of COVID compared to people living in affluent, richer areas. So we've used it for lots and lots and lots of things. Since then, of course, we published some of our big paper yesterday on COVID and learning difficulties, for example, and we're doing lots of work on vaccines and all sorts of other things. But the point of it is to, today was to really show you that this was a, is a secure platform <clears throat> which where we're holding the data securely, the data don't move. All the work is transparent, and reproducible. So every bit of code, every bit of every bit of coding, every bit, everything we do is all there for people to see, and people can come and reproduce what we've done if, as and when they need to. Lots of other outputs. So, to finish, it's up to us to do better research, not just more research. That's what I really want to get across today. Uh, here's some of the things, the 11 things I've talked about mainly today and try to illustrate different aspects of that. And uh, thank you very much for listening. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Professor Smith. A very wonderful lecture. We uh, learn a lot of new things and innovative ways of uh, dealing with the uh, big data. Now we want to move on to the Q&A session. And uh, if anyone has a question, please, uh, yes, Imanaka-sensei first, and please. 
Uh, Professor Smith, uh, thank, I thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. I have, and I have some, uh, some comments and one question. Well, uh, now there is a trend uh, that observational studies with big data are getting more and more important to obtain yeah. findings. And in our Japanese setting too. And today's topic is very timely for us. Yes. And thank, and thank you very much. And the, uh, and, uh, the, fa the first paper of mortality risk of COVID-19 patients, uh, yeah. amazing, a uh, very, quick, very quick publication. Uh, uh, amazing for our Japanese perspectives. Our data is always slow and have uh, strong limitations. And we, we need more collaboration with the government to establish usable databases uh, besides academic competency. And so, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, I learned again that the databases are very important. Uh, and uh, and you should, at the total of the lecture, you showed us the key points comprehensively and concisely to improve the analysis and to understand the analysis results. It is very instructive and very helpful for us. And thank you very much indeed, again. And, uh, and I have uh, one question. Uh, mm. I, I am interested in the step 11 uh, keep the public with us. Yes. And um, you explained on one example showing people that the data are important and mm -hmm. used. And uh, could you explain more about what are most important tasks for us to do in order to keep the public with us? Yeah. I think for me, it's two, two, three. I think there are three factors. I think the first is convincing people accepting that people's clinical data are hugely sensitive and really uh, that, that we really fully appreciate just how sensitive and private people's health data are and to really fully acknowledge that and uh, that it isn't unreasonable for people <laughs> to want their health records to be kept completely private and confidential and that's uh, totally understandable. And I think that's the first thing to say because you, yeah, I think there's, there's some suspicion that, you know, researchers don't understand that or don't appreciate it. But of course we do, I, you know. Um, but I think it's really important to keep saying it. I think secondly is, is for people to understand that while health data are special, um, we do need people's health data to, do, to be able to be run a high quality, effective health system. And people know this. So if you take um, data on... COVID vaccination coverage. How, how could you run a decent COVID vaccine campaign as a country without knowing who's been vaccinated and who hasn't and which groups are getting the vaccine and which ones are not and where? And people know that we need to use their data to run an effective health system and they accept that, but it's quite important to remind them. And I think the third factor is there's a suspicion that, that may be a little bit UK specific but I'm not sure that people are worried that their data are being sold and used to, for people to make profits out of that are, that are, are not benefiting the health system. So there, you know, there's always a worry that their data are being sold to Google or to Apple to do things. I, I don't think, I don't think people believe that Google and Apple are going to do evil <laughs> But I think they're worried that they're going to use people's patients' data to make profits that are of no benefit to the country and no benefit to people. And I think that is a major concern in the UK, and it's one that comes up again and again and again. So, and I guess lastly, sorry, just a last fourth point, we'll say to always remember that, and it's true, that these data do belong to patients, just as these are data about, you know, my data, my health data, I really do believe it belongs to me. It's about me. I really do belong, think it belongs to me. So I think accepting that it's perfectly reasonable for patients to um, have a strong opinion on what happens to their data is, is another thing to acknowledge. But the profit venture is a, it's a big thing in the UK. It's a big worry in the UK for people. And it's a little bit difficult to define 
but it definitely causes a lot of concern. I think, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the third point is also important for Japanese situation too. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. yeah. You. Thank you very much. So now uh, I want to open the floor for question. If any of the participants have any questions, please uh, either raise your hand or uh, put on your microphone and uh, ask uh, Professor Smith question. While other people are thinking, I also would like to ask some questions. So uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, open data, use of open data is a challenge. And uh, uh, you explain a little bit about uh, uh, ownership issues also, but uh, can you, in your experience, can you explain a little bit uh, more in detail in the case of uh, UK or uh, England, what exactly is a challenge or difficulties that you will be facing when you are using open data? Um. I think the big challenges in, in the UK are the open data is, is ensuring that the data are indeed um, kept securely and confidentially, that, that there's the idea that it's possible to anonymise these data. And uh, in fact, we've shown time and time again that you can't anonymise more. And if you totally anonymise them by taking out any possible thing that could link back to an individual, you make the data pretty well useless, um, apart from for counting things. Um, but so a really key challenge in the UK is keeping people's confidence because uh, we have a national health service, which, you know, and, and particularly in, in primary care general practice, um, more than 99% of the population are registered with the NHS general practice system. And so it offers a huge opportunity for research using these data, but at the same time, people can refuse to allow their data to be used. And that is an issue. They're called, it's called opting out. And of course, the more people who opt out of allowing their data to be used, the, the, the worse it gets. And it, it's, it's a fairly low level of people who opt out at the moment, very low level. But it is possible that more and more people will as they hear of these concerns. So the challenges are there and we just really need to keep public confidence up. And as I said, I think the main thing to get across to people is that we, we <laughs> health, yes, health data are special, but no one would ever try and run an education system without data on the education of the kids. And no one would ever try and run a, an, an economy without data on the tax revenues. <laughs> and, and that's okay. And so it's, it's the same thing. You wouldn't try and run a health service and provide care without data on health. And I think getting that concept across to people that while we accept health data as special and important and confidential, if, you, if people want a decent health service and want good health care and want, these, want, to know, want us to know that vaccines are safe, then we need these data and there's no other way around it. Thank you so much. Uh, we are encouraged by your uh, comments that uh, in Japan too, uh, use of open data is a problem and uh, especially difficult when uh, public concerns are raising. Yeah, but yeah. hopefully we can uh, collaborate with other people to uh, try to uh, explain in a nice way that uh, can gain uh, confidence of the general public. Yeah. Okay, so anyone else have a question? Sumimasen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, dear Professor Smith and Iwanaka Professor. And Kano Sensei, good afternoon, too. Uh, I'm from Uzbekistan. I'm leading specialist of uh, health department in the department of uh, Minister of Health Department of Uzbekistan. Uh, also, I'm a research student in Kyoto University. Department uh -huh. of uh, Taku Iwami, as, as you know, I think. Uh, so uh, my question is one of the important questions. So as you mentioned, uh, data collection is also is, uh, most important for every researcher. So mm. for example, if I want uh, to look at or use to data or some, some, some data in UK, 
which uh, website you recommend me to uh, to use for my research for, uh, for example now i'm checking in the google and yeah. may i screen my uh, demonst screen demonstration i, sure. I want just to show i want just to show the okay. sorry wait you want to share the screen yes yes may, okay. may i demonstration screen? yes please uh, so Yes. So if you if, if you if you see, I yeah. I, I found two uh, website. It's uh, yeah, most yeah. common in United Kingdom. This is National Health Statistic, I think. Yeah, yes. yeah. And second is wait, sorry. And this is Government of UK. Yeah, also, yeah. I found some uh, data about health statistics. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Professor Smith, I just uh, may I use this uh, two of the website as uh, open data in my my if my res research. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's there's a huge. I mean, there's probably I I I wouldn't even know how to guess. There are probably tens of thousands of different websites in the UK with um, various different bits of health data on them. Um, if you're after, you know, it depends what you're after, really, in, t in terms of, um, because the other big place would be the Office for National Statistics. But uh, it really depends on what you're after. But there's a huge number. There, it, the, the, what there isn't is a kind of single resource um, that points you to all the different data sets. Uh, that's for sure. There is, a, there is a venture called Health Data Research UK, HDR, capital H, capital D, capital R, and then a hyphen, and then UK. And they are probably the closest we have to any kind of central um, attempt at cataloging data. But where there isn't a sort of central, you know, you, there isn't one website I can point you to. But HDR UK would certainly be, um, I mean, this, this is just a, one of the, this is NHS England, but I mean, there's some data, you know, data reports on that, but the, what I'm saying is it's, it's basically total chaos. <laughs> um, you could be there for a very, 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 very long time. And I think you need to be much more specific on what you're after mm. um, because there is a huge wealth of different um, resources and varying levels of different data available and different results. But HDR UK is probably the closest we have to any kind of central effort at, at, at putting forward a kind of a summary of what's available in, in, and what might be available. Uh, okay. Thank you, Professor, for your, so for your answers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kano Sensei. So, so any other questions from anyone else? Uh, Imanaka sensei again, please. Okay, uh, because um, many stu students are very shy today, uh, I'm going to give another question. Well, uh, in, th in the last part, you explained Open Safely platform. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that is very attractive for us. Yes. The technology and the rules to open data safely is uh, one of the key factors to promote research. Mm. And uh, on the other hand, you have the general practitioner's database. Uh, yes. General practitioner the, database. Yes, CPRD, uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. And uh, how, well, uh, it, uh, it may be difficult to explain in, sh in a short time, but uh, how do you develop that kind of platform. Uh, yeah, well, we, uh, the, the academicians uh, should should be involved, and also mm -hmm. the collaboration with the government will be very important. And uh, yeah, how did you re realize that kind of platform? Well, the Open Safely platform came about um, from an idea that we had this idea, and um, Ben and I then and then the. The data, the clinical data are held by the software developer. So the, so the clinical software is the, the front of, you know, as, as, as I as a clinician, what I see is the software when I'm entering data about a patient. And the data, the software providers hold all the data. And we knew they held the data. 
um, and they hold it very securely and very well, and they've done it for decades, and they do a great job. And we wondered if it was possible for us to analyze data on their system, within their system, as a secure way. And um, we were delighted when the so TPP, which is a big software company, um, agreed to talk to us about that. And um, now the data are under the overall governance and oversight of the data are through NHS England, which runs the National Health Service on behalf of the government. And the data are collected as part of NHS care. So NHS England have ultimate um, oversight of the data. So we were we got approval from NHS England. That was quite a job <laughs> to do this. And TPP were it was a working relationship, and they, they've contributed a great deal, actually. I have to say, and give them credit. And I think, to be honest, it was an opportunity that came about because of COVID. I think because of COVID, people were willing to really make all the extra effort we were asking of them and to really do extraordinary things that I suspect without COVID, we would probably still be trying. <laughs> um, I don't think we'd have got as far as we got. And so I think in a way COVID kind of forced people or made people sit up and think, okay, let's try this because we really need to do something. And there were some emergency regulations in the UK um, called a COFI notice, which is around a national emergency, which made you, some of the data safeguards, they were still present, but it, it gave people some confidence that for COVID research, um, they, they would have the kind of backing of the government and things. And so it just, it meant that it was just made it a little bit easier for us to get this off the ground and then the software provider was hugely huge hugely supportive and in fact um, lent as a server to do all the re to do the re um, research to do the analyses on and amusingly um, <laughs> when we they they told us they were having to take the server out of operation for 24 hours to fix it and ben and i said oh don't worry we'll, we'll buy why don't we buy another one and at this point they told us that this server costs <laughs> well, 700,000 pounds, which is about a, a million US dollars, at which point we, we just burst out laughing because I think we both thought it was this server that cost a few thousand dollars. <laughs> and in fact, it's this huge bank of uh, things. But anyway, uh, so it's been a real great collaboration, actually, between the NHS, the health service provider, the software providers and the academics. And then and we've, we've employed some quite a few software engineers to make it happen. Uh, so it's been a bit, it's quite a task, but um, yeah, so don't, uh, it's not easy, that's for sure, <laughs> but it is possible. Great, uh, great story, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this is a very informative for us to drive the Japanese database system. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Imanaka, again, and uh, nice. Uh, Comments by Professor Smith. Good morning, Professor, and thank you so much for the lecture and good afternoon, Nancy. So actually this is somehow my personal episode. So I was doing a report on the comparison between two countries about their COVID pandemic situation. So yeah. yes, I used one platform that is the WHO dashboard and the other platform was uh, our awarding data. But it turns out that they do, data interaction was kind of different. Like say, actually it's like China, like they, they put all re regions <laughs> in, uh, of China in, on that WHO dashboard, but when it comes to the, our warning data, they separate China, the mainland China and Taiwan and Hong Kong in different parts. Yeah. So I realized this question. So I like to know what, how can I know whether I choose a proper data platform or how can I know my data selection is mm, validated? Yes. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. I, and I have to say, I'm not quite sure of the answer, but the, I think the, the, the more you can know about how data were collected, how the sampling was done, 
what the data re represent. Um, and often, often that data isn't available, you know, often that information may not be available. But I think, um, so in the, you know, taking the UK as an example, uh, in the early part of the pandemic, the, the varying testing, COVID testing data that was made available, it was reasonably transparent if you, you looked again and again and again, um, that the, the sampling was very selective by geography, and this was no one's fault, that there were people who had symptoms were far more, far more likely to be tested in certain areas than others, that repeated testing was happening and not always being linked to the previous test. And there were various problems with the data. So I think all one can do is really think from first principles, okay, what am I trying to assess here? So for example, if you're trying to estimate incidence of COVID infection, for example, you need to think about, well, am I sure I've got the denominators right? Am I sure what's the sampling frame? Who's getting tested? How often? Why are they getting tested? Is it random? Is it selective? And what are the possible biases? And it really is a matter of going through step by step in that way. Um, the frustrating thing, of course, is that often you won't have that information available, <laughs> uh, particularly from, uh, you know, and, and, and so it can be very, very difficult to judge. And I think if you haven't got that data available, the information available, all you can do is, is be quite cautious in your interpretation. Um, but particularly in COVID, as we, as we know, some of the, a lot of the international comparisons have been hampered because uh, the data available from different countries has been so different. And that isn't a criticism, but it, the systems have been so different for how data have been collected and how they've been analyzed and what they mean. So it's a real challenge and uh, you know, I wish you all good luck. But all, I think all you can do is really think through what's the question you're trying to answer. Okay, what are the important components of that question? Is it the denominator? Is it why people are getting tested or why they might not be getting into the data set? Who's miss, who could be missing and why? All those, you know, all those sort of issues. And just going through it step by step and seeing what information you can get. But it can be hard to get the information. Thank you so much. Any other questions? I think everyone is shy. That's fine. <laughs> I also wanted to ask another question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, you develop a methodology called case only approach. Yeah, well, we didn't, we didn't develop it. We, um, it was initially developed, the, the, case, the case series was developed initially by Paddy Farrington at the Open University. And then we, we later worked, we applied it a lot. And then we later worked with him to develop a kind of an approach to tackling the censoring issue. But yeah, mm, sorry, okay. go Okay, okay. So I wanted to know a little bit about on what kind of condition or what kind of data it, it is better to use a case on the approach. Yeah, so the case-only approaches, I think, are really useful, but they, they really require – what you're measuring in a case-only approach is the timing between an exposure and an outcome, and that's what you're measuring. And so within an individual, you know, you're expecting an outcome, say it's um, – what was it say a stroke you're expecting it to happen at random over time you can take into account that it's more likely to happen in winter and that kind of thing but roughly speaking and then you take an exposure like um getting an antipsychotic medication and you and you see if there's an association between the timing of getting the antipsychotic medication and the timing of the stroke and if they if they are closely related you have to ask why and then it may or may not indicate a causal association, and that's something to think about. What questions are good for? Well, you need really good data on timing. Um, and you really need either a, an acute event or the onset of an event. And the data on exposure, the exposure either needs to be, um, you need good timing data for the exposure. It needs to be a point exposure, such as a vaccination, which was what we originally used it for, or something where you can measure a period of exposure and you have periods of exposure and non-exposure. But the main, th so, so yeah, it, they're, they're useful for some things, um, but the data on timing are the really key issues, I think. And then the interpretation 
of how you're going to interpret any association you see between timing of exposure and outcome is quite key because, of course, just because an exposure and an outcome are related in time and are close together doesn't mean that one caused the other. So it's very interpretation is very key. Okay, thank you so much. I learned so much and hopefully other participants too that mm. this new, uh, maybe it has been going around, but uh, for me, it's yeah, a yeah. new insight mm. that uh, we, I felt like by hearing what you said, we can think about uh, more innovative yeah, yeah. research design to do a new type of study. Any other people question? One last question maybe? We have three minutes. Maybe uh, Professor Smith has a question to uh, our students or <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything yeah, you be, want to know? Uh, yeah, I, um, I'm not, I have very little knowledge of what health, it computerized or electronic health record data are available in Japan and whether the, I don't think you have a single, I know you don't have a single system but I wondered if what data were available for research and whether people are doing research on that. And I'm, I'm aware that some individual hospitals have good data systems, but I don't know about linking up on the population level, the extent to which that's happening in Japan. I don't know if anyone wants to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Imanaka, would you like to say yeah, a few things? Yeah, yeah uh, you, are, you are correct. Yeah, we have uh, several lab large scale vendors which provide electronic health records, um, but uh, they are not in the common platform. And so we cannot collect the data as a whole at the national national level. Uh, that's the problem. And we have only the database of claims data at the national level. But, but uh, we have a lot of limitations to use, use that data too. And so uh, we have been discussing how to standardize the LEHR database, uh, but uh, we have a large data, but we don't have the national level comprehensive yeah. data yet. Yeah. And now uh, we now we don't have that uh, time left, um, but uh, for example, we have. If you you or some uh, members in London School have mm -hmm. some interest in comparing uh, health healthcare, uh, for example, uh, COVID nineteen cases uh, between Japan and uh, between the UK and Japan, uh, we'd like to have some collaboration in this mm -hmm. comparative research. Because, uh, in, for example, in Japan we have a lot of uh, elderly people. Mm -hmm. And we input a lot of resources to elderly care. Yeah. And um, for example, uh, any elderly people can enter ICU in Japan. Yes. And uh, we do a lot of uh, input for this region. And so maybe there may be, there may be some big difference between what's happening in the UK healthcare system and in Japan. And, and so uh, it may be helpful, uh, maybe possibly for for both national health system. Mm. And yeah. uh, we would um, well, anyway, we'd like to uh, continue our collaborative work at the school level, uh, including uh, many members and many graduate students. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful lecture today. We, we learned a lot and inspired. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I have one question from one of the participants sent to oh, me. Yeah. So I just want to read this question to you. Observational studies of the COVID-19 vaccine are very similar to the results of RCTs. What do you mm. think about this point in providing causality in observational studies? That's the question. Yes, I think they have been quite similar. And I think that's because, um, mostly because of the, you know, the, the, 
people are coming forward are quite representative. You know, we're not getting very selective groups coming forward. So I think the fact that we are getting the you know, people are coming forward as vaccines become available and people are keen to get the vaccine. I think that we're seeing very similar in the UK that the, the observational studies are providing quite similar answers to the randomized trials and we're seeing effectiveness. So I think it reflects the fact that there isn't this strong confounding one often sees. Um, although we may see that uh, later on when perhaps when we get to 85 or 90 percent coverage, that the last 10 percent who are not vaccinated may actually be quite different to the vaccinated. But at the moment, I think what we're seeing is av- as vaccine coverage is being rolled out, that the, the vaccinated and unvaccinated groups are actually very similar to each other because it's simply a matter of time and location and vaccine availability that's determining whether people are vaccinated or not. So but that may change over time once we get to high coverage, I think. Thank you so much. I hope this answered the question. Uh, and now the time is uh, up. So I once again would like to appreciate very much Professor Smith for taking your valuable time to thank give you. us a lecture. Well, thank you for listening. Good luck with all your work and your careers and good luck with uh, good luck with the Olympics is all I can say, <laughs> amongst other things. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, such a nightmare, but uh, yeah. hopefully you'll be able to see on TV. And, uh, yeah, I'll be watching on TV at least, safely yes. distance, yes. Yes. So thank you once again. Uh, we appreciate very much. We learn a lot. And uh, hopefully we'll, someday we would like to invite you to Kyoto. That'd so be great. please uh, One remember day, yes. until then. All right. Okay. Bye all. Thanks again. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very Bye-bye. much. Bye. This is the end.